So, um, a couple of you have some trouble or some unexpected results with the neural networks. And um, generally, if you can't make the architecture work, um, it's also okay to report on that. And um, basically, if you tried something and what you tried looks like it, should, uh, it makes sense, and the, despite your best efforts, you, don't make it, uh, you can't make it work, that's fine, just write about that. It's uh, the, actually the most common outcome in any machine learning is you don't make it work. And so um, I expect that there's ways to make all of the tasks work and improve, but they might not be super obvious. And so I don't want you to like stress out for and like spend 20 more hours on it to just get the architecture to train. Um, another thing I posted, uh, on Piazza, I'll link to a blog post that I all uh, recommend you read uh, by Andre Caparty about uh, training neural networks in practice. He's the uh, director of AI at Tesla, and so he works on all the computer vision for Tesla, I think. Cool. So today, I'll do a very brief o overview and summary of um, what we did so far. So I hope this will mostly give, give you some structure maybe to um, think about how to practice, how to learn for the exam and um, also give you the opportunity to ask some questions if you're here. Um, oh yeah, I also, uh, I published the practice exam today and I'll probably publish the solutions for the practice exam tomorrow. Okay, cool. So, a year of today is I'll just sort of go through um, some of the main points of the second half of the semester and um, just sort of, yeah, highlight some parts. Um, the exam will also contain parts that I don't highlight because I can't highlight everything in uh, one hour, 15 minutes. So, before the uh, spring break, even we um, started working on model inspection. So um, generally this lecture is very focused on pr making prediction and supervised learning. And um, so model inspection somewhat ties into this, but not, di not really directly. The goal of model inspection is often to um, debug your model, understand your model, to to build a better model, to clean up the data, to understand what's wrong with your data, or how to create new features. Um, sometimes results of model inspection are used to make decisions, but um, that goes usually with a big caveat that it's very hard to, to interpret complex models very re reliable. So if you make decisions based on uh, what a neural network does or what a random forest does, um, I caution you to, uh, well, uh, yeah, I suggest you ca cautious and, um, but, but using um, understanding from model inspection to improve your model is pretty straightforward because you can always check, does, did your model improve or not? Um, there's uh, two kinds of model inspection in a sense. Um, one is building a model that's interpretable from the start, like a small tree or a small linear model. And we talked about this a little bit, but mostly in the model inspection part, we talked about how con can we do post hoc explanation. So post hoc meaning I already built my model, it's a complex model. Um, how can I understand better what's happening inside the model? Um, so there's different kinds of explanation even for the post hoc one. Um, some that are more explain um, behavior, not of the specific model that was trained, but of the family of models. So like how would a model change if you drop features? Um, so just doesn't really, if you have a neural network, it doesn't explain what the weights in this specific network 
um, learned, but what a network might learn. Um, there's other that explain uh, the model globally. The main examples of those are the permutation importance and partial dependence plots, which I'll talk a little bit uh, about some more. And so here, the, um, these are both forms of marginals where we look at how does a single feature um, influence the outcome, but we try to do this globally, meaning for the whole data set at once. Another kind of explanation that we only briefly touched upon is explaining models locally, which is about um, finding explanations for why a single decision was made. Um, so here the ex prime example is Lime, where you're locally fitting a sparse linear model. And so this tries to tell you, okay, we rejected the credit card application for this one customer, why did we re reject this customer? This is not necessarily the same as what is the most important feature on deciding um, if someone gets a credit card or not. So I don't have a nice uh, figure for permutation importance, but I have the code, which is very simple. So in permutation importance, um, we can use this on any model. Um, and basically what we do is we select a feature we want to analyze and we want to find out what is the impact of this feature in this trained model. And uh, the way we do this is by just randomly permuting th this particular feature, this column in the data set, and uh, see if we pass this data set, our say our validation data, through our model, how much worse is the performance? That tells us how much does the model rely on this feature. And then we repeat this for a couple of um, like different uh, random samples or different permutations of that feature. And uh, we average this, and this will tell us for each feature, how much does the model rely on this feature in its predictions? Or how much do, do the, does the prediction get messed up if we mess with this feature? So this is, a nice, this is nice because um, it explains any trained model. It's slightly, well, it's not that expensive, but it's like it takes some computation because you have to uh, run through data sets through prediction multiple times, but it's pretty cheap um, comparatively. Um, the, the other tool that works on um, what I call marginals um, in a different way are partial dependence plots. Um, they actually show how globally a model depends on a certain feature. Here, these are for um, a gradient boosting model on the Boston housing data set. And what it shows is what is the relative difference in the outcome if I change, uh, say, the room variable from seven to six. So this um, because, uh, doesn't take interactions into account. You can do this for two variables at a time, but uh, usually it's done for one variable. And so if the, the nice thing is it can capture non-monotonous relationships. It can tell you exactly what the relationship looks like, but only uh, marginalize uh, on one particular feature. I think um, uh, and I showed a couple of libraries that do this. And so for, for here, you can see the y-axis is the offset <coughs> of, uh, against sort of the mean prediction, while um, for some libraries, it's actually, actually the prediction that you will get out of it. So one of um, the things we can do once we know something uh, about what features are important or what are the role of features um, is doing feature selection. Um, I think one of the most important things about feature selection is to understand why you're doing this. It's something that sort of 
people just do in general, but often I see people apply feature selection without really um, motivation behind it. So you can hope that you will get a better model by avoiding overfitting, but um, in practice that's actually well, relatively rare. Because if you included some feature in your data set, you probably had some thought behind why did you include this particular feature. And so dropping features from your data set is unlikely to yield big uh, improvements in performance. If you include a completely useless feature, most models are robust to that and will be able to uh, train even without with the useless feature present. What you do get from uh, selecting features is you get a more compact model. A more compact model means you get faster prediction and uh, possibly faster training time um, and you require less storage for the model and possibly less storage for a data set if um, creating the features is part of the data collection process. Finally, uh, after feature selection, um, building a model the model will be more interpretable because it uses less features. If you have, um, if you're training a big random forest and you go from 100 feature features to 80 features, it's still not going to be interpretable. But if you have a simpler model, then removing features can really help. Oh yeah. Um, I think the question is about features that leak the target information. So um, this is really an issue about the process that generated the data, and um, sometimes your data in your data you record something that is not the outcome, but it's very highly correlated with the outcome. And it's something that you um, wouldn't have available during um, applying your model. One of the examples that I gave was that's sort of more straightforward is um, from the Lending Club data. This is about giving credits to people, and it record records their FICO score. And the goal is to predict whether someone will. Um, return their credit or not. However, the FICO score is created after all this happens. And so the FICO score is like how credit worthy someone is. And so basically, if they didn't return their credit, the FICO score went down. And so the FICO score is very low. While um, if they did return the credit, uh, the FICO score is probably high. And so in the, at the point where you need to make the decision, about um, should I give this pe person money or not, you don't have the information of the future FICO score. So this is not information that you should include in building your model. Um, maybe a similar example is like on the Titanic data set that you're probably familiar with. Um, there's like the goal is to predict who survived the Titanic and who didn't. And one of the columns in the data set is um, which boat, which rescue boat they were on. And so basically, if they made it on a rescue boat, they probably survived. Um, and so if you include this information, this will not really tell you something about the a priori chances of the person. The question was, how do you identify these features? and? Um, I don't think there's an automatic way to do this. One way to screen for them is find features that are highly informative and see if they're highly informative that they maybe actually leak target information. Um, in the homework though, actually, uh, it turns out that I think for the application that I gave or for the scenario that I gave, the highly informative feature was actually a feature that was valid to use. It was about um, whether the hospital um, accepts uh, Medicaid 
and that is something that you know a priori about the hospital. It has nothing to do with the particular payment that we're looking at. And so in this case, this, this just meant the task was very, very easy, given this information. So how easy it is or not easy it is, is not necessarily telling you is this leaking information or not. Whether something that's highly informative is leaking information depends on the scenario uh, you're looking at and what will be the information you have available at the time you need to make a prediction. Basically, if this information is available to you at the time you need to make a prediction, um, then it's uh, fine to use. Um, unless there's, it's, there's um, um, confounding fac uh, factor that is in your training data but not your test data. Um, so if there's something that is, uh, that, let's say you have two classes and there's something that distinguishes the classes uh, in your training set um, because of the way you collected your training data, um, let's say you collected uh, user surveys and everybody that, like, and you went to two different universities and um, you went to two different institutes and so um, the answer they gave you is highly related with which institute you went to, um, then if this is not, okay, I, I think I, I can't really, okay, I can't really make up a, uh, a um, confounding feature example on the spot without a slide that I think will be easy to follow. So if there's a confounding variable that's in the training collection but not in the test collection, you might also be leaking information. Okay, the question is, what do I mean by an interpretable model? And so, um, if the model, as I said, sort of, you have is a simple model, so you have um, basically an a priori explanation of the model, like in a linear model, you used to say you have the coefficients, and the coefficients tell me everything about the model. And so, if the model is small enough, I can um, interpret I can uh, use the coefficients to describe the model in a way that's sort of human understandable. To understand what it means for your application, of course, you always need domain knowledge. But basically, what I mean by interpretable mo model is if you have the domain knowledge and you understand the task, then it'll allow you to interpret it. If you use a uh, random force, then without using any of the tools like uh, permutation importance, no matter how much domain knowledge you have, it'll be impossible for you to understand what's going on. All right. Um, so this was sort of about um, understanding um, models better and getting more interpretable uh, models. Um, the next thing we talked about was arguably going in uh, the opposite direction. Um, which is automatic machine learning. So in automated machine learning, the goal is to um, find a model or a modeling pipeline together with hyperparameters uh, that work well on a new task. So basically you want to um, automate away the model, uh, the searching for a model part, which is sort of one of the annoying parts of being a data scientist. Um, so there's parts sort of to the data scientist job that you can automate and arguably selecting a model is the one that is uh, easiest to automate because uh, it doesn't really require domain, domain knowledge as much as uh, other parts. It might still require domain knowledge but um, potentially less than say pre-processing a data collection. So the way 
uh, my machine learning is usually formulated is as um, a black box optimization um, problem. So you do one big search. You can imagine like a grid search over um, all possible uh, models, say in scikit-learn, with all possible hyperparameter settings, and then you can create all possible pipelines with pre-processing or um, transformations or um, whatever you want. And so you can create uh, many, many possible pipelines with many possible um, parameter settings, and we want to pick the one that generalizes best for our data set. So here in this formula, so F would be the training loss, uh, sorry, the validation loss, and parameters would be uh, lambda, and here parameter includes everything that specifies the whole pipeline together with all hyperparameters. Uh, so usually it's not feasible to search this complete space. Um, if you have a continuous parameter, it's obviously in infeasible to search the complete space even if you um, even if you only have one. The usual approach in grid search is we discretize continuous variables and then we search over everything in the grid. If you have a very high dimensional parameter space or you have like very many uh, different pipeline options, then um, this also becomes infeasible. And so we're looking for alternatives to brute force search um, for this maximization problem. Um, with basically the issue of brute force search or grid search being that um, the runtime is exponential in the number of parameters. There's uh, mainly three approaches that we talked about, um, random search, Bayesian optimization, and successive halving. Um, the first two are um, complete black box methods. They work for any function. The first one is very simple. It just says randomly sample the, spa the state. Sorry, randomly sample the space and evaluate the function. So instead of trying to enumerate all possibilities, we just randomly pick a couple. If you look at um, efficiency in terms of how close do I get to the optimum versus uh, how many um, iterations I need to run. And remember, each iteration here means training a model. Random search turns out to be much more effective than grid search in many practical settings, even though it uses no, no knowledge of the process. Um, the other methods we looked at that's been quite popular in neural nets uh, a while ago is Bayesian optimization. This is also a black box modeling mm, uh, approach, though um, this is sort of trying to pick the next point to um, test in a smarter way. Bayesian optimization approaches, typically they create um, a surrogate function that tries to pro approximate the function that we're trying to optimize. So our, the function we're trying to optimize is sort of the validation loss. We're trying to predict the validation loss for our parameter settings, and then um, we pick the next hyperparameter uh, combination to try based on what looks most promising um, according to our uh, internal model. Most promising is here measured usually in terms of um, combination of the objective function value, so how good do we think it's gonna predict, and how uncertain are we about the prediction? Because you want to uh, reduce uncertainty during the search procedure. And this is what a Bayesian comes from in this name is because um, these approaches require a probabilistic model uh, of the data, so you have uncertainty uh, over the function values for the function that you're approximating. Um, the third one, successive halfling and hyperband, um, which is in the same family, um, are slightly different in that they are not black box optimization. They are what, I, what is called, or how, um, 
I put them under the heading of multi-fidelity learning. Success of halving is uh, quite simple, but really effective. Now, really, um, you should look at um, like more, de more detailed into it, something I really highly recommend using in practice. The idea here is to, instead of doing an evaluation of our model on the full data set, which might be very expensive, um, we limit the budget of how much computation we allow ourselves uh, for each hyperparameter setting, and then we, al uh, we allot more computation to the more promising candidates. So this can be either in subsampling the data set, so I, I start everything out with like hundreds of the data set, see which parameter setting performs best, and um, then I take, in the case of halving, I take the best half of them, and uh, then I double the budget. And this way, in each iteration, I half the number of candidates and double the budget, and this is a very efficient way to searching a, to search a big parameter space. Um, it's called halving because of the two, uh, though the authors I think recommend now to actually use three, so it would be su successive thirding or something, but I think people still call it successive halving. And so this is not black box optimization because here we exploit the structure of the problem. We use uh, cheap approximations of our objective function. So the objective function is the validation loss of our model trained fully on the full data set. And the cheap approximation is, say, the model trained on a subset of the data. Another way to limit the budget would be to limit the number of trees in an ensemble or to limit the number of epochs in the neural network. So you could start training um, like 100 neural networks or 1,000 neural networks, and after a couple of epochs, you look which one is the best, and um, you drop the ones that are not performing well. The issue with this is, I mean, the, the potential downside is that you drop th something too early because it will only um, actually perform well once you wait long enough or once you give it enough data. So for neural networks, you can imagine something that starts learning slowly but in the end um, finds a better solution. Success of halving might throw away something that starts too slowly. One thing I hadn't mentioned then, um, but I mentioned in the neural network lecture is um, genetic programming. So that also probably should be on this slide. In genetic programming is, excuse me, another black box optimization procedure um, that tries to search um, a big structured space for a global optimum. Um, the reason why people use this for neural networks is that it can work very easily on graphs. And uh, neural networks, as you know, are graphs, and we want, to, we want to tune the architecture of a neural network. It's much easier to do this using uh, genetic programming than using Bayesian optimization. Bayesian optimization would uh, usually use something like a Gaussian process, which requires continuous input data, and it's quite hard to represent a ne network architecture, which is like the graph of all the layers, all the hidden units, and so on, in a, as a real valued feature vector. And so genetic programming is better at searching over things that are graphs, like neural networks. Okay, let's see if my voice uh, survives another half hour of this. It's great that I have to teach for eight hours tomorrow. Um, so the next thing, um, so then we talked about um, unsupervised learning. And um, 
I only want to briefly talk about a couple of them because um, I mean, some of them will be in the uh, exam, but these are things that are, I would say, not as useful in practice, well, except for PCA, uh, as, the, um, as the other techniques we talked about. So PCA is really the one technique that you should understand really well in terms of unsupervised learning and dimensionality reduction. And um, it's, it's not really that this will be like part of all your state-of-the-art machine learning uh, pipelines. It's more this, this something that helps you understand the, the data better. It's very helpful in exploratory data analysis. So here's the um, objective for finding the first principal component, which is um, first principal component is the direction of maximum variance in the data. Um, or you can think of it as the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix of X. And so um, once you found the direction of maximum variance, you project your data um, to remove uh, this component and then you find the component of next most variance. This leads to all the components being orthogonal and being uh, ordered in order of decreasing variance. So the first component explains the most variance, the second, the second most variance, and so on. You can see this here in 2D. Though in 2D, uh, it's very boring because for the second component, there's only one possible choice. Um, so, one thing that you should, um, pay attention to uh, if you look at these is that um, these are eigenvectors, so um, we can normalize them to unit length, so because the length doesn't really mean anything. Uh, you have the eigenvalue, which is different from the length of the eigenvector. Um, but uh, sort of, even if you make it length, be length one, it's still, like there's, um, it can point in two different directions, so you can multiply it by minus one and it's still an eigenvalue. And um, so basically the direction in which the arrow points here is arbitrary, you could also point in the other direction. And very often uh, when people interpret uh, principal components, they don't take this into account and they say, oh, here's a large value, here's a small value, but what's large and what's small, like if you take the sign into account, is not actually relevant. I don't think I'm gonna talk through the mechanism of PCA. Um, yeah. um, the other technique that is less important to understand, but more important if you want to make pr pretty pictures and impress someone that does not really know a lot is manifold learning. Um, so the nice thing about PCA is it's a linear transformation. So you think of it as a rotation followed by a projection and so if you can like picture things in an n-dimensional space, then you have some idea of what this does to your data. Manifold learning algorithms more generally are things that do nonlinear um, dimensionality reduction. The motivation is you think you have um, a higher dimensional manifold embedded in your feature space. So here in this example, the feature space would be three-dimensional and there is a two-dimensional manifold embedded in here and we want to recover this, this low-dimensional structure of the data and to so basically unroll the Swiss roll. Um, probably the most commonly used um, manifold learning algorithm is uh, T-SNE and um, why do I have two slides of this? Um, in practice, I would also recommend you look into oh my God, FastVis and uh, UMAP, but uh, TSNI is sort of the industry standard for visualizations. And so here, this is a visualization of the uh, 10 class handwritten digits data set that's in scikit-learn. You can see projection on the left by PCA. Actually, I think the projection by PCA is quite nice because it already separates out uh, a couple of the classes. 
in a, so here I colored by the 10 classes. Uh, given that PCA is completely unsupervised, I think it's actually quite nice to, to see that some classes separate quite well. Um, but if you look at TSNE, um, TSNE really optimizes for this two-dimensional embedding and uh, it's also completely unsupervised, but it's able to nearly perfectly pick out all uh, the, the classes as clusters in the data. And the places where uh, the classes are separate, I think for the orange is nine, these uh, different clusters correspond to different styles. So this is helpful, um, again, for um, exploratory analysis mostly. So some people have used it for feature engineering, but that's not very commonly done, I think. Uh, often it is helpful to look at these and um, see, okay, why is this point over here? Is it mislabeled? Uh, why? Why did the, uh, is this different from all the other points? Or um, is there some particular direction um, that this, this corresponds to? Usually these, um, the two axes here are not interpretable at all. Um, they don't correspond to anything in the input space. But uh, sometimes you could find that they have some meaning in your, um, in your data. Sometimes you can also, if you apply TSNE and you just get one big cloud and you see nothing. Um, you can try changing the perplexity parameter, but sometimes you just get nothing. No, nothing useful, at least. Um, so that's definitely possible. Okay, so um, the question was about linear and quadratic discriminant analysis and how do they fit in? So the linear discriminant analysis um, fits in in that it is, in a sense, quite similar to PCA. You can think about it as, or I like to think about it as a supervised variant of PCA, but it's not really. Um, but it also assumes, it assumes a Gaussian model of your data for each of the classes. Um, the reason I brought this up in this context is it's quite useful also for visualization um, because you can do a lower dimensional projection that's also linear. To me, linear projections are very interpretable. And so um, I often can, you can see the structure of the class. I was like, hmm, like I have no time, right? But maybe, maybe have just enough time. Let's see if that, how, how badly this works out for me. Okay, this is not a very great example. So basically, it allows you to. No, this is also not. Okay, I don't have a good example. That's too bad. Um, nope. Well, it allows you to project your data using the Gaussian model. So here, this is not a great example, but you can see that um, these are different PCA projections. And um, okay, they make the data, so make the classes look pretty well separated. This is the LDA projection. It actually has access to the class labels and it tells you, oh, actually, we can perfectly separate in linear. What this tells me is there's, this is a very simple data set in that I can perfectly linearly separate the data and that is sort of the, the obvious way to, to solve this data set. Um, linear discriminant analysis learns um, a Gaussian model that's joined for all of the classes. This is why we can do this projection. Uh, quadratic discriminant analysis does not allow you to do this kind of projection. So quadratic discriminant analysis cannot be used as um, um, dimensional reduction 
technique, at least not in an, any obvious way. Um, but I also brought it up because it's very closely related to uh, LDA and it's like a classical model that you should also think about. Yeah, so, um, and what you need to keep in mind when comparing PCA and LDA is that PCA, whatever it discovers, it discovers without any class information. So this, is, this means it's like super obvious in the data, whereas LDA uses the class information. So, um, if you have High dimensional, high dimensional enough space, it will always find perfectly discriminating directions. Um, so keep that in mind. So in a high dimensional space, saying things are linearly separable is meaningless, they always are. Anyway, I should have a better example on this website. Um, Um, last, or not the last, we talked about two more unsupervised algorithms. Um, I think I'll want to go through them like relatively quickly because again, I feel like uh, supervised algorithms are much more useful in, in practice. Clustering again, um, I would mostly th uh, think of as um, a technique for doing exploratory analysis. There's also techniques to use it for feature extraction Though these days, I think most feature extraction um, usually is done with like some some form of neural network. Um, I mean, you could definitely use k-means for doing feature extraction, but it's probably it's maybe not the most obvious thing people would do these days. And um, yeah, k-means is uh, the most commonly used clustering algorithm. You should definitely know how it works. People will ask you in the interview but you will never use it afterwards. Um, we talked about some limitations in terms of the cluster shapes. You can, you can uh, model with k-means. Um, so k-means is really particularly useful if you want to do a vector cartization, that is if you want to break up your uh, data into separate parts and treat it all of them separately, uh, each of them separately. You can think of k-means also as a way of uh, compressing the data in a very extreme way. In uh, PCA, we compress the data as linear combination of the principal components. In um, k-means, you can think of it compressing the data as one hot, one hot vector where, or a single categorical variable, where the categorical variable um, tells you which cluster does it belong to. In, in this representation, each data point would be just represented by its mean. Actually, if you have um, a very, very big data set, that might actually be a reasonable thing, a reasonable way to cluster, uh, to represent your data would be just replace like uh, each batch of like or like rank k means, and then just do computations on the cluster on the clusters instead of doing something on the whole data set. It's like a very aggressive um, uh, compression technique. But, but it might be useful in some cases. We also talked about NMF, which is non-negative matrix factorization, which um, involves um, non-convex optimization. I mean, k-means is also non-convex. Um, that is sort of, has some characteristics both of k-means and PCA in that it represents each data point as um, a linear combination of um, some uh, weight vectors, or you can think of them as prototypes, and it's a nonlinear. So all the prototypes are uh, non-negative, and the linear combination is also non-negative. So you can think of NMF as a positive combination of prototypes. Um, whereas in PCA, you would say it's an arbitrary combination of prototypes, 
and in k-means you pick exactly one prototype. One thing that makes NMF um, quite different from PCA is that um, the transformation from the data X to the latent representation or hidden representation H is nonlinear. Um, the goal here is to approximate X as the linear product of H and W. But this is not the same as saying that um, H is a linear function of X. Going from X to H is like, is a given fixed weights is a convex optimization process. So you can actually extract nonlinear features with this method. So yeah, all of these techniques are often, uh, like NMF, K-means, and to some degree PCA are used on, um, often on very high dimensional data sets like uh, gene data, um, also um, text data, which is probably the most uh, common high dimensional data you will work with. At least if you go into industry and not into biology or something like that. Uh, so very quick recap on the uh, on representing text data. So text data um, is really quite different from the numeric data we looked at before. And uh, our first goal is to create features that represent an arbitrary string. The most basic way to, to uh, represent an arbitrary string that we assume is like a document is using back of words back of words, build some vocabulary over all possible words, and then represents each document by how often each word appears. This uh, discards uh, completely any uh, order of the words. So uh, like love not hate is the same as hate not love. Um, and uh, so you definitely lose some information, but it's a very powerful model in particular. This is sort of, whenever you do anything with text, this is the baseline you need to compare against. Um, and it, yeah, it really works surprisingly well. And then once we have this very high dimensional sparse representation, uh, we can use our standard models and um, yeah, L linear models work, are usually sort of the model of choice for this. Um, at least traditionally, um, more recently, people use neural networks, which then relates us to word embeddings. Um, before we go to word embeddings, <coughs> excuse me, um, there were some modifications that um, we um, talked about. One was TFIDF vectors, which is a, a rescaling of the data. The other one is n-grams, where instead of looking at single words, we look at um, words that are next to each other. So, off, so we could, might augment um, our word counts that we have for each individual word with uh, word counts of neighboring words. <coughs> so, um, for example, in the window of two for bigrams or trigrams or so on, and. Um, this allows you to get some more context and gives you uh, slight uh, improvements in performance often. Um, question is, does this still count of bag of words? Um, I would say yes, but I'm not a uh, NLP person, so an NLP person will, no, I think they would, I'm not sure. It's a question of semantics. Um, yeah, pr probably yes. I, w I would go with yes, but uh, don't don't quote me on that. It's only going on YouTube. Um, okay. So the other way to represent uh, words instead of using these one hundred vectors um, 
is uh, word embeddings. So word embeddings are basically um, representations trained by a very shallow, simple neural network um, that take as input the one hot encoded version of your word. So this is the back of word representation uh, where you have the length of inputs is the number of words in your vocabulary and one of them is one for the word that you're currently interested in. And um, the, go the goal is to create a nice representation and we do this with um, an auxiliary task. So we create a task that we're not really interested in, but uh, that will have as an, uh, but that will help us create nice representations. And the task is um, to predict what words are in the context of a given word. Oh, there's, um, th did I show both? There's the continuous back of words and the skip gram models. Um, and so, um, both of them basically, uh, one of them tries to uh, predict uh, one word that is in the context of many words and that the other one tries to predict from one word, many other words in the context. And um, these, uh, are learned using a neural network with a um, linear hidden layer and then softmax output layer. So softmax meaning um, basically the same as um, logistic regression or you use softmax now and it'll work a lot for your neural networks. So this is a very simple one hidden layer neural network um, where there's no nonlinearity on the hidden layer. Yes. I'm not entirely sure if I understand the question. So the question is, I think, about the vocabulary. So here, that we, s we have a vocabulary that's, for this example, small, say 10,000 words. And um, so the, the um, word embeddings only exist for the words that we know in the training data set. And so if there's, um, I mean, we're not really interested in this prediction task. We're interested only, the first layer of weights here are basically, uh, these are our uh, word vectors. And they only exist for the things that are in a training set. So we want to create a very diverse training set that contains a lot of words. Um, so in the homework, I think um, a lot of you used uh, one of the Google uh, ones that has, I think, three, uh, three million words. But um, whenever, something is not in the vocabulary, there's basically nothing you can do with this model. Oh, so basically for, so if I have a 10,000 word input data, would it all work in the vocabulary? And then my possible output words are only the same set of words in that set. Oh, okay, I thought you changed the set of words and not all the additional words that you're possibly Oh no, so the input and the output are the same. But I mean, the, the, tr the training samples are, you, s you sample, um, from a neighborhood, so given your, given your collection of documents, um, let's say you sample, you pick one, uh, one word, this is the, the center word, that is your input, and then you sample like five words around it, and these are the ones where you put in a one for the softmax classifier. But, uh, but the space of possible um, words is uh, the same for input and output. So th here, 
there is a lot of classes in this. Uh, so this is one of the uh, difficulties of training is this is the, the number of classes is as much as the number uh, as the input um, space. And so this is and there's like tricks around this. Um, So there's two questions. One is, when should we train our own model? And two, um, what happens if we have lots of out of vocabulary words? I want to talk about the second one first. So uh, what happens with lots of out of vocabulary words? Um, so fast text, which is one of the existing implementations, actually has a pretty nice way around it. And I think uh, the original slides had a link to the paper, which is also embed uh, three character three grams or generally you embed character n grams so as long as the n grams that make up the word um, were in your training set then uh, you can still create some representation and so basically yeah you could uh, look at all the three grams in your word and then you just average all of the for each of them you have a word word vector like a syllabus vector um, and then you average them over the word and then you have a representation um, of the word um, so you wouldn't want to do this just by itself but basically as a fallback uh, or additional information if you don't have um, the uh, um, if, you don't, if it's not in the vocabulary, this can help. Um, when would you train your own um, word embedding? Um, I think either if your vocabulary is very different to the standard vocabulary or if the semantics are different. Um, also, so then, then you need to if the words mean something else in your context and they mean in the normal context, then um, you probably need to retrain. If you have a large enough data set, um, if you want to get out like just a bit more performance, you could argue um, always retrain, though um, basically this is not state of the art anymore for text classification. So if you want state of the art for text classification, uh, use the state-of-the-art models that we unfortunately didn't have time to talk about. So, um, yeah, if, if your domain is very different, if, you ever, if either the meaning of the words is very different or your vocabulary is very different, you should uh, you need to start from scratch basically. Um, but uh, these days, this is mostly something that is used as like a baseline or initialization. And um, because this is actually easier to understand than the current models, which is terrible, uh, because this is not easy to understand at all what is happening here, at least to me. Um, yeah, we also talked about the uh, cool uh, analogies and relationships that you can. Uh, you can create it um, using um, vector representations and it is maybe still quite surprising to see that you can uh, do semantic operations using uh, linear algebra on vectors. Oh, another thing that I wanted to mention here is um, one thing that is similar to this that you might see in uh, practice is, so basically here you're going for, your input is a one hot encoded vector, so there's lots of zeros in one one, and you're trying to predict something. And then we take the weight matrix, so each, oh my god, column, column in the weight matrix corresponds to an input feature, and we now uh, use this as a representation for this word here. We can do the same with any categorical feature. So um, if we can come up with some task to train a network, so this is um, 
a prime example of sort of unsupervised learning because uh, we don't require any labels here. It is, in a sense, a supervised algorithm because you're trying to predict something, but the prediction task we just made up, we're not really, we don't really care. So if you can make up uh, a task um, for your categorical variable, you can use something uh, similar to this to create um, embeddings for arbitrary categorical variables instead of words. Um, one task that I think is uh, commonly used is try to predict the rest of the feature vector. So if you have one categorical variables and like couple continuous, you can try from the categorical variable to um, predict the continuous variables and then you could take again the, the weight matrix as a representation of the category. This one. Hmm? The first one. Yeah, the W. So here it is uh, V times N, where N is the number of hidden dimensions. So here, if I have, okay, let's say here, if I have 10,000 words and 300 neurons, that means the weight matrix is going to be um, 10,000 times th uh, 300. I think it's it's three mil the vocabulary. Oh no, it's three hundred thousand. Uh, I forgot. Is it three hundred thousand or three million? One of the two. But the, the, the embedding size is like the n size is three hundred. Yes. Okay. The embedding size is three hundred, which is the size of the hidden uh, layer, which is also just the size of the matrix. Like you just learn a matrix that is now input uh, number of uh, uh, vocabulary size times um, hidden layer size, and also called embedding size. Do you have any solution as to why adding more hidden layers help? Adding more hidden layers? Yeah. I don't think adding more hidden layers here helps. Why not? Um, empirically. <laughs> uh, you laugh, but that's how deep learning research works. Um, I mean, I mean, why, why is it linear? That's really weird for a neural network for that. But then, I mean, okay, the, I'm sure you can find papers that give explanations. The problem with a lot of these things is that they are post hoc explanations. And you can come up with many different post hoc explanations of why something happens. Um, an, an explanation is good if you can make a prediction. Uh, unfortunately, that very rarely happens in neural network research. that I'm aware of. With the, um, with the like, current state-of-the-art models like, uh, like Almo and BERT, um, deeper is actually better. OK, yeah, we talked a lot about neural networks. I guess you, I don't need to explain to you the basics again. Um, I think um, maybe my explanation of convolutional networks was a little bit short, and uh, fortunately I don't have the uh, nice visualizations um, right now that would be, uh, to show what convolutions do. I really encourage you to try to um, like look up online really what convolutions are and how the convolution relates to um, the matrix multiplication that you usually have. So you can write the convolution um, here going from the hidden, uh, from like an input image to several um, feature maps in the first hidden layer uh, as a matrix multiplication. And you should really try to understand uh, how this happens. Convolutional nets are really um, quite a powerful tool, in particular for images, video, and um, audio. People have used them for text. These days, people don't really use them for text. But um, if you want to do any deep learning, you really should try to deeply understand um, what 
what is going on here in terms of operations. Also, um, one thing that um, I think is, is sort of important to think about, and I will also be on the exam, um, so it's even more important to think about for you, is um, thinking about what, um, in this diagram, what are the things that are specific to a given image? So if I take an image and I feed it through the architecture, um, what will be produced that is specific to this image? So I call them activations on these feature maps. Uh, I had a discussion with uh, Francois Cholet last week uh, who wrote Keras. In Keras, they're not called activations because only 10H is called, and Relu is called activations. So I'm not sure what they call it. But you, you get some float values for all these feature maps. And so it's um, one of the things I said on Piazza is that for the convolutional neural networks, really the, these activations you have in RAM are much larger than the parameters that you're uh, tuning. And um, whereas for fully connected networks, it's usually the opposite uh, way, where sort of your weight matrix is like a big matrix and your um, hidden layer is just a, just a vector, whereas in convolutional networks, um, your weights are just the small filters, while your activations or feature maps are like quite big. Um, I think it's on a practice exam, there's a thing about uh, calculating the number of weights, so hopefully you get some, some practice with that. I think it also helps you understand really what's going on. So there's three tricks that you probably all know, intimately familiar with that we talked about. Um, uh, dropout, batch norm, and um, residual connections, um, which were sort of, people came up with in this order. Um, I realized I didn't talk in the lecture about uh, data augmentation. I should have really done that first. Data augmentation is the trick that becomes before all tricks, and it's one of the most important tricks. More data is always better. So if you can make up data uh, that is actually realistic, you always win. Uh, more data means you can train a bigger network, which will work better, and everybody's happy. So, um, I mean, if you can collect more data, that's even better. Usually if you collect data, you also need to annotate it, which is very annoying. If you create synthetic data, or if you augment your data, say by rotating an image or mirroring an image, you don't need to annotate it again. And so you can create much bigger data sets to learn your networks. And um, as you saw in the homework, you can even create basically an infinite stream of data by applying all possible rotations or translations or whatever. And so in this case, basically no image is seen twice by the network. Of course, there's still only a limited amount of variation um, in the data, even if you transform it. And so um, you s it'll not allow you to perfectly learn everything. Okay, the question is, how do you augment your data set in the imbalance case? Do you keep the imbalance or not? Um, and I would say, I think for neural networks, people often 
um, decrease the imbalance. So you want to um, create more data for the minority class, not necessarily make them equal size. It might still be worth um, augmenting the bigger class um, unless there's so much that you can't use all the data. Uh, if you have the choice between um, taking a new data point that the network has never seen, that's like actually new, and a different augment, uh, like a different transformed version of one that it hasn't seen, the new data point it has never seen is obviously better. Will contain more new information, but um, basically, once you see this, like if you see the same data point ten times. Maybe you should have replaced like nine of them with slightly mo slight modifications. So can I say that under the same conditions as Margaret, it's, uh, you always have higher priority to uh, augmented data from the minority class instead of running into the same people who got or equally exploited the work from the minority at the I'm not sure if I would agree. So the, so the, the com comment was like, um, we should give more budget to augmenting the uh, minority class. So I would really think about it as data streams. And so um, you could stream data um, from the minority and the majority class basically at the same rate. So you stream from both sources. You take one image here, one image here, or probably like 256 here, 256 here. And um, Basically, each of the classes feeds in a host, so you could take in a complete, uh, perfectly balanced data set, um, but still, every uh, every image I take went through my augmentation pipeline. So that way, I would give exactly the same amount of budget to um, to both of them. Uh, you could say that if I have already a lot of data from one class, maybe my maybe I don't need as strong as distortions. Because I see them less frequently, maybe I only rotate by one degree instead of rotating by between one and 10 degrees. Um, but I think for images, it's quite common to just always throw in like some, some uh, sort of jittering of the data to, cr to uh, prevent overfitting. I was like, okay, I'm not actually gonna talk through all of these things, um, because we already had them. Um, maybe if anyone has any other questions for neural networks or in general. Um, uh, for batch noise, do you think they encounter problem when you sparse the data? <laughs> sparse the data? Okay, the question is, when using batch norm, will we encounter problems with sparse matrices. Um, I don't. I don't see why. Um, but I'm not sure. Like that's a impl implementation specific issue. So it could be that it's not implemented in Keras. If you're having an issue, um, I would assume it works. In theory, I think there's. Well, I guess. Well, I mean, the, the adding the mean is tricky, right? But you could like pretend at the mean by running the mean through the weight matrix. So I think you could work around it, but maybe this is not implemented. So, or maybe there's an issue with the workaround that I'm not seeing right now, trying to go through the computations in my head. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess doing it the straightforward way, uh, that shouldn't work or wouldn't work. But also, like usually, you would do batch normalization within the network, and within the network, usually things are dense anyway. So, if your data is sparse, like the text data is usually only in the first layer, and so maybe yeah, then don't do batch normalization in the first layer, but do it in every layer afterwards, and then basically, I mean, once you do any matrix multiplication, everything becomes dense.
question is, is it okay to subsample the data uh, for um, homework? Task three, uh, the answer is yes. But you can also, you probably don't need to load all the data at once. You can also, and then, so if you don't load all the data at once, you can still use the whole data set without ever rolling it all in RAM. I mean, no, don't, don't load the data all at once. You only need to iterate over parts of the data, right? So the same way you can think of the data as a stream with the data augmentation, like I'm not gonna store all the augmented data, right? There's infinite many augmentations I can make. I'm not gonna store all of them. I'm just gonna uh, create them once I need them. And so the way, same way I can iterate over the files on disk and uh, load them when I need them. And I'm pretty sure Keras has built in support for that. Though it might, it might, it's probably slower than doing the uh, subsampling because then you need to read the disk all the time. I think with the flow from functions, it's basically just the batch size. If you use a smaller batch size, it will fit in memory. Yeah. And also for task one, so you mentioned the regularization of spread something. I just want to make sure you write up to use the L1 or L2. Uh, no, when I talk about regularization, I meant L2 regularization. No, regularization. So if you want to light up to use drop out regularization, you will say drop out regularization. Yes. Is there any uh, principles of fast, fast practice when we, like, it's before or after which layer we want to add drop out or batch one? Um, question is about best practices for dropout and batch norm, and, um, oh, you mean the, the order of them, or? Yeah, the order and like, what kind of layer before or after do you constitute your I mean, batch norm is uh, after, either either before the nonlinearity, or I think people now do, just after the nonlinearity, whenever there is nonlinearity. So batch norm once per nonlinearity, and uh, dropout, also once per nonlinearity. Um, the order of the two is a good question. Um, and I'm not sure what common practice is. Uh, but you can, I'm sure you can find online. <laughs> Things evolve pretty quickly and the opinions change. And it's been a while since I really deeply used uh, neural networks. It was before dropout. All right, um, so I'll be gone tomorrow on Wednesday, so I won't have office hours on Wednesday. Nicola will be here, and then uh, next Monday I'll see you here for the exam. <laughs>